right. Well, I'll just um, get us started with a, a quick introduction of tonight's topic and our speaker. Um, so this is a partnership that we have uh, with the U of A Speakers Bureau. We're so grateful um, that it allows us to bring in amazing speakers with um, just a, a breadth of knowledge. And it's part of the City of Learners Initiative, uh, which is a, uh, an initiative that lives at the library and that has lots of community partners coming together to uh, provide these types of learning opportunities for Edmontonians. So um, our speaker tonight is Dr. Jacqueline P. Layton, who is a registered psychologist and a professor in the School uh, and Clinical Child of Clinical Child Psychology at the University of Alberta. She has uh, she earned her doctorate in 1999 from the U of A and has some postdoctoral training from Yale University. And she has been investigating children's development, learning, and achievement for nearly 30 years. Her research interests include understanding the mental models children form about new learning situations, clinical interviewing for test development and validation, the social and emotional triggers of poor assessment performance, and instructional methods for enhancing formative feedback to students. And she has published numerous articles and written several books published by Cambridge University Press and Oxford University Press. So we're so happy to have you here tonight. And um, yeah, if you can take it away. Thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us this evening. Um, kind of late in the evening, so it's always nice to, to see the faces. And I, I really wish we were doing this face-to-face, -face, I have to say. Um, I, I love the Zoom and I love the technology, but I also really like to be able to, to give talks and interact with people face-to-face. -face. I think that we're all sort of missing that right now. Um, so um, today, the title of the talk is The Thrill of the Spill, because one of the things that I want to talk about is how anxiety can be, and, and really nerves can be really uh, a very positive aspect of child development and certainly uh, working with children and what happens to individuals as they move through life. But the thrill of the spill can actually get a little bit uh, problematic when it starts to dominate your life. And that's sort of what I want to talk about. So today what I, what I want us to discuss, and I'm only going to talk about 30 minutes, and then what I really want is for you all to give me your comments, questions, thoughts, ideas. I always find that to be the very best part of the, the, the talk. So I'm going to talk about anxiety today and the good, the bad, and the ugly. They're certainly good, they're certainly bad, and then certainly there is some ugly parts of anxiety that ultimately we, we need as parents. Um, children, uh, educators have to work with. Um, I'm going to specifically talk about the anxiety freeze frame. Um, where do we learn this and how can we unlearn it? And then I'm going to focus on learning triggers that tend to put us into this fight or flight or freeze mode that can be quite debilitating for children and frankly also for adults. Children become adults, so if we're able to detect it in children and then help them unlearn it, um, while they're children so that they become very resilient adults, they can be very uh, good for them. So I want to begin by talking about good anxiety. So good anxiety is all about what gets us going to conquer the world. So we get really um, the adrenaline rushes, we know the mountains we want to climb and the things that we want to do. And frankly, I would say that society is quite obsessed with, certainly Western society, obsessed with conquering the next uh, obstacle and climbing the next mountain. This is um, an aspect of our culture that infiltrates all of us and certainly parents who have children who want the very best for their children. Sort of this idea that um, how to be successful and how to win friends and how to, you know, be fierce and accomplish the next big task. And we certainly know that children are now doing bigger and better things almost than we've ever heard them do before. And in fact, it's led some columnists, very respected columnists, such as David Brooks for the New York Times, to talk about, are we a culture obsessed with success? And is there a cultural decline that comes with that? And as a psychologist, I would say, is there a certain level of very unhealthy anxiety that comes with sort of this obsession with performance and 
and success. Certainly some uh, performance, um, focus on performance is very good. It helps us uh, minimize mistakes and it certainly helps us improve our skills. But this, this focus, um, almost this obsession with performance can actually be quite debilitating. And this is something that we're finding increasingly in children and young adults. So I would say here that it's important to talk about um, bad anxiety as well. So what is, what is normal anxiety and what might be considered bad anxiety? We all, first of all, um, have to acknowledge that we all come into the world with a certain temperament. And we all come into this world as very young children with a different um, threshold for anxiety. So some children come into the world with very easy temperaments. They tend to be very open to novelty. They don't get scared very easily. Um, we typically call these children um, easy, uh, easy kids, right? They're easy babies. And then there are some children who are uh, more difficult and some who are uh, labeled uh, slower to warm up. So we all have different anxiety set points that we inherit uh, through, our, our, through our parents in our DNA. And also we learn um, how to be nervous and we learn a, an aspect of anxiety. So there is everyday very, very normal anxiety, which can actually become more of an anxiety disorder. So for example, here we have everyday anxiety, such as worrying about bills or landing a job or maybe a romantic breakup. For children, it might be an embarrassment or self-consciousness um, moment at school, or it might be getting, um, sort of getting, doing well on the next test. And this is actually quite normal anxiety. And, and this is the type of anxiety, anxiety that actually helps children and even adults focus and attend to the task at hand and do what it is that they need to do to prepare for the job interview or prepare for the test or prepare for um, the athletic uh, competition. But when it becomes a disorder is when it begins to dominate the way that we think about the events that we have to do and the things that we need to accomplish. An anxiety disorder is when we begin to have this sort of constant and unsubstantiated worry where we begin to feel a lot of distress about a number of different things, um, outcomes, and we feel like life is not going to be um, the same and we're going to feel quite um, uh, debilitated and like failures if certain things don't work out. And this can become quite debilitating uh, certainly for adults, but certainly for children, if they begin to see everything in their life as something that is do or die. If I don't do well, this is the end of this for me. If I don't get into the athletic, if I don't get on the athletic team, that's it, I'm done. And certainly children have a, a tendency to, in, in some cases, uh, aggrandize or, or exaggerate certain outcomes, but um, we, we know that th they also learn ways that can make certain events appear much more important and greater than what they really are, or some children are able to better understand how to calm and soothe themselves and put um, outcomes into perspective. And so the real, um, the real challenge is how to be able to use anxiety or nerves in a positive way without letting it overcome and really debilitate the, the healthy part of life. So the, the ugly part of anxiety too, we know is that it is increasingly becoming one of the most diagnosed psychiatric, psychiatric disorders in young children. We are seeing more and more young children being um, admitted into hospitals and being diagnosed with debilitating anxiety. So, and, and this is not just in, in young children, but also increasingly uh, we're observing this in young adults and, and adolescents. We know that there um, is, has been an, a, uh, about a 23% increase in need for anxiety medications and also a 45% increase in antipsychotic medications for adolescents. And normally there's always a prevalence of anxiety in these, in these kinds of conditions. One of the reasons that we as psychologists and educators tend to worry so much about anxiety is because there are associations with anxiety in adolescents, for example, and later risks for a number of, of really negative outcomes. So for example, major depression, nicotine, 
nicotine and alcohol abuse, illicit drug dependence, suicidal ideation and suicidal behavior, and also other aspects such as educational underachievement and early parenthood. And so there are a number of, there's, like, there's almost a constellation of outcomes that begin to um, uh, arise and children are at, at a greater likelihood of experiencing if they are um, at a very early age already experiencing anxiety. So where does this um, anxiety come, come from? So one of the things that we know is that um, anxiety, as I mentioned, is a, something that we are born with, right? So um, we all come into the world with a certain temperament and a certain genetic disposition for feeling nervous and, and very anxious. But we, one of the things that we also know from many, many studies that now have been done in families is that children also learn how to be anxious from, from parents and from significant others around them. So for example, one of the things that I, um, I like to talk about in my class is the anxiety freeze frame. And that is that um, children, when they are very young, one of the things that they learn and one of the things that sort of they come equipped to do is how to social reference and how to take cues from parents as to how they should be feeling in ambiguous situations. So for example, uh, when a child, um, we all know, for example, when a child um, falls in, in, on the street and uh, sort of hurts his or her knees, they sort of get up and they sort of look at mom and dad and they think, well, well how am I supposed to react? Should I start crying? crying now or should I not? And depending on how parents react, often the child will follow through. And so this is the, this is essentially social referencing that children do. And they're taking cues from their parents. What should I be doing right now? Should I be really freaking out about what's happening to me? Or should I just take it in stride and, and just um, not worry about it? And, and certainly when the situation is ambiguous, this is really key. This is where children are really taking their cues from parents. I mean, if a child has really hurt them, themselves terribly, they're going to cry regardless, and they're going to be hurt. But in the ambiguity of the situation where children are really learning how to react, they're taking a lot of information from parents. And so children are learning a lot of nonverbal uh, responses from parents as to how they should um, feel and how they should react. And so, for example, um, you have uh, a parent uh, who might be very, very concerned that a child has hurt himself or herself, the child starts crying and then the parent is worried. And then, you know, you get almost this cycle where the parent begins to think, well, uh, my child can be hurt easily. They can be, they're very fragile. And so I have to really worry. And so this almost begins a cycle of the parent thinking the child is fragile, the child feeling that they are fragile because of the way the parent reacts. And then the child is more likely to, um, um, overreact in certain situations where in fact the child could be a lot calmer. So the, my point here is that there, there is an aspect of the anxiety freeze frame where it's not just how a child comes into the world with a certain predisposition towards becoming upset, but this is also something that the child is learning from significant others around them. And the importance of, of really thinking about the environment of the child during a child's increasing anxiety response is that it becomes a cycle for the child. So for example, a child is in a situation and I'll just sort of, um, I, I hope you can see it with my cursor. A child is asked a question or prompted to speak and let's imagine that's a really um, anxiety feeling situation for the child and the child feels anxious and avoids the situation. And then the parent, because the parent obviously um, in many, many cases wants to protect the child and wants to ha um, avoid having the child feel any kind of negative um, feeling or any kind of negative outcome, removes the child from that situation. And then the child by being removed from the situation feels a lot better and is actually reinforced for not being in a situation that makes the child feel anxious. Now, silence and speaking for the child, for example, is reinforced, um, is accidentally reinforced by the parent and for the child. And now the child begins to learn that this is an, uh, a, an okay response. And the parent also is facilitating that response and essentially enabling that response. And this becomes a cycle. And it becomes a cycle because certain types of responses are reinforced. The child feels 
like this is adequate. The parent feels like this is adequate because the parent thinks, hey, I'm, I'm protecting my child. I'm removing the child from, from this discomfort. What the, the difficulty though with this is that there are some situations where children are going to feel uncomfortable that are actually good for children to learn how to navigate and problem solve on their own. And children are going to take cues from parents that this is okay for them to feel not so great in the situation because they can actually do the problem solving and they can, they have the skills and the ability to resolve this on their own. And so this often happens when children go to school or when they have a, um, a test coming up or they have problems with friends where um, very well-meaning parents um, are attempting to rescue children from having to, to experience any kind of negative outcome or any kind of negative feelings or any kind of discomfort. When in fact, we know through lots of research in the area of resilience and confident children, that children in order to develop confidence, it's not the absence of being in situations that are uncomfortable, but because children are um, able to uh, learn to problem solve in situations that are, in, that are increasingly uncomfortable for them. And so what you have, and this is a, a really, I think a really nice figure from an article by Cav uh, Locke, Campbell, and Kavanaugh, where you have um, a situation where very high responsiveness to children can actually um, lead to negative outcomes. So for example, paying a lot of attention to the child and, the, and so having a lot of attention and always showing too much attention to the child in, in, in all aspects of what they do, where um, is, the child is, is given I, um, messages that they are um, always right or very special, that they cannot really experience any or, or very few negative outcomes and really protective of the child. And what's, what's interesting is that um, the, the, the feeling or the message that children begin to acquire from these kinds of very high responsiveness parenting is that they may actually not be competent to deal with a lot of life events. So the very high responsiveness parent is different from the low demanding parent um, and also from the very high demanding parent. Um, but the, the, the main point here is that when a parent is overly responsive um, to a child, essentially almost being present, increasingly present in all aspects of the child's life and not um, responding to the increasing development and independence of the child, the child can actually be, begin to, to feel that they are not competent to be able to handle life and to be able to do their own problem solving. And so you can have a situation that is actually quite unintentional, but certainly consequential, where children are beginning to learn triggers where they're feeling incompetent and, and anxious. So for example, a parent might very, in, in a very well-meaning way, want to help the child and make the child feel better in situations where the child might be experiencing some, some um, hardship. Um, and in fact, what, what the parent might say in a very well-meaning way can be interpreted by the child um, as I'm really not competent to be able to handle this. So for example, here are some examples of well-intentioned messages that can be interpreted in a very different way by children. So a parent, for example, um, a child comes home and hasn't done as well on a test as he or she would have liked to. The parent says, well, I can't believe you only got 75% or it could be 60% or 80%, whatever the case might be. Something must be wrong with the test. So the, 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 the culprit here is the test and not the child. And what the child hears in this situation is 75 is not only not a good grade, but it's, it's not my fault because something is actually wrong with the test, not with me, but something wrong with the test. Now you might first think as, as a parent, oh, well, isn't that good that the child thinks that there's nothing necessarily um, that they have, that there is nothing that they need to do differently, that there's something wrong with the test. The problem with that is that over time, um, it's something that they can't control. Children learn that th there are things in the world that are negative that they actually can't control instead of uh, trying to take responsibility for what happens. Um, another thing that a, a parent might say, for example, is in, in this case, athletics, imagine athletics. 
the practice for the athletic um, event is way too early for you. How will you get up? They really need to reschedule the practice. Let me call and make sure that they reschedule the practice. And what the child um, in, in essence is hearing and learning is that um, they don't actually have the willpower or the discipline to get up early for practice. So what would a parent say instead to be able to, um, um, it, you know, fill or, or strengthen the child? Um, yes, the practice is early, but we can do it because it is important. And if it is important, then we will make the time to get up early um, and get up and practice. Um, so the, the idea being that yeah, the, the overprotective messaging that sometimes parents pro provide can actually uh, backfire, especially if children begin to think that there is actually something that they can't handle or there's something wrong with them that they can't handle the adversity or the, the challenge of the situation. So the research literature has actually established that there is an association between sort of this parental psychological control and child anxiety. And parental psychological control is specifically defined as influencing children's behaviors through the use of covert um, or kind of hidden strategies that the parent might not even be aware of, such as guilt, um, induction, invalidating feelings, and forming an environment where the parents' acceptance of the child is contingent upon their behavior. So in essence, the, 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 the worldview that the parent holds ends up being imposed on the child as to how outcomes should, should come out, what kinds of um, events they should attend, what kinds of individuals they in fact, or even what kinds of friends they need to have and feel about those friends. And this is not really uh, behavioral control. Behavioral control is when you set curfews for children or you ask them to clean up their room and you sort of, you, you create structure and guidelines for children to be able to have uh, a well-disciplined and orderly environment. Psychological control is when a, a, a parent or the environment in which the child child is in is really about um, in minimizing the child's own feelings and the child's own thoughts and the child's own strength in a situation and really imposing what the parent thinks should be felt or should be thought about. And so these kinds of um, uh, discussions or talks or messages that, that in the environment of the child, um, significant adults in the child's environment send can end up becoming subtle or micro messages to the child that they are not fully capable of dealing with certain situations. And so one of the things that has been found is that when, when parents begin to exert a lot of psychological control, the child's perceived sense of control actually um, decreases and it goes down. They, they don't feel like they have uh, control over their immediate environment and they don't have the capability or the power to be able to solve problems. And this has been found to lead to increased child anxiety symptoms. So according to the American Psychological Association, resilience is really uh, one way of using anxiety in a really positive way. So situations that would naturally lead to anxiety or naturally lead to a sense of um, nervousness or nerves can be used to bolster the child and actually allow the child to experience the anxiety, to figure out the problem solving techniques that they should use, and then to actually learn to be truly confident, not just superficially confident, but truly confident. And this actually means taking um, maladaptive anxiety, which is something that we don't want. So I'll talk about that at the end, but it ends, essentially it means taking normal anxiety or healthy anxiety, which might be to be concerned about a test um, or to be um, really um, focused about wanting to make uh, a certain athletic team or a dance competition or to, to do something that is important for the child to do. And to instead of having it take over and become maladaptive anxiety or constant worry, getting in the way of performance and actually turn it up, turning it into something that is adaptive and resilient. And essentially what that requires is for the child to understand that there is a, an important relationship between what they do uh, in terms of practice, in terms of dedication, in terms of time and their performance. But in the end, that that performance, even if it doesn't go as well as they want it to, isn't 
isn't debilitating, isn't going to be something that they can't um, uh, survive or they can't overcome, that, that there are going to be struggles, that there is going to be adversity, that not everything is going to always work out as they, they thought or wanted it to work out as, and that they need to sort of go back and that sort of this this cycle of trying and, and redoing um, is actually part of learning how to become um, strong and how to become a problem solver and how to become ultimately um, resilient in, in what we do. And the other aspect of this is for children to learn that not everything that they try is actually going to work out for them. That sometimes life has a way of, of uh, creating opportunities where certain things work out and certain things don't. And to be able to accept that gracefully and to move on. So one of the one of the important parts of what parents can do is be instead of just um, one one of the very important things is to be very aware of the emotions that they're showing to children. So for example, as I mentioned very early on, sort of this anxiety freeze frame, there can also be a cueing of resilience where if children feel uh, very overcome with a certain emotion, worry, fear. Um, for a parent to be the source of calm and the source of soothing. And uh, the reason I mention this is because, again, children are always social referencing parents. Parents are a, a profoundly important um, influence in children's lives. And so very early on, there have been uh, numerous studies done on how much children reference uh, parents. And even there is a, a wonderful video that I always show um, students in my development classes. And it is the video on the visual cliff. And uh, very young children, um, one 18 month old uh, children are on this visual cliff where there is some plexiglass and uh, there appears to be a big drop off. And children, very young children, as they're crawling through this um, this cliff that is, as you see here in the in the in the checkers, um, they they see the drop off. Now they're not going to fall because there's the plexiglass, right? The plexiglass. But they look at their parents, uh, the mother's face in this case, and depending on whether the mother has a smile on her face or whether she has a fear look on her face, the child will either move forward or not move forward. And so there you have this ambiguous situation where children, even in an ambiguous situation where they apparently see a drop off, they will still go forward because um, the parent has a, a, a facial expression that is suggesting it's okay to come forward, you will be fine. Um, however, children will not do that if the parent has a, a, a look of fear on their face. And so uh, what happens to the children who see the, the parent and there's a look of, of this is okay, you can come through uh, the plexiglass and you're gonna be fine. Well, this is something that children in ambiguous situations and in situations where a lot of children might say, well, am I supposed to be cry or, or overreact or be very upset that a parent can be very comforting and help a child learn to be resilient and to problem solve and to see their adversity or challenge as an opportunity for overcoming um, the kinds of challenges that they're going to find throughout their lives because challenges don't, don't stop. In fact, uh, the more people achieve and the more accomplishments they wish to acquire, the more setbacks and challenges they're going to face. So one of the aspects of parenting that can really reinforce good habits is um, responsive parenting, right? So uh, talking to children, reframing uh, situations for children, helping them see situations in a different light, really lowering those um, levels of stress in children, and also being able to create very strong structured environments where children are going to have the time and they're going to see parents um, exercise the very habits that they are also recommending children to, to do. So for example, discipline, self-care, really taking time to, to focus on tasks that are important and are meaningful where you want to see um, uh, a certain outcome or certain good performance. So um, I'm going to be ending here soon and I want to end with these three points. 
what can we do as educators and parents? And one of the first things that um, I talk about with um, parents that I talk to and um, in the work and studies that I do is the very first thing is that parents need to acknowledge that there are certain uh, genetic markers and certain temperamental dispositions that children are born with, to be sure. Um, th this happens um, and there's going to be individual differences um, in that respect for sure. But more importantly, those kinds of anxiety uh, dispositions can be overcome with appropriate training and discipline and uh, modeling on the part of parents. So parents, one of the first things that parents can do is to be very aware of their own physiological and emotional reactions to stressors and really learn to relax and to model the kind of relaxation techniques and calming techniques that they want to see in their children. So this is actually very important because children are always watching parents. They're always watching them and children are learning at an incredible rate from the significant adults in their lives. And so as children watch mom and dad or, or caregivers react and talk about certain events, that is going to influence the way that they respond to obviously not the same events, but similar types of events in, in their life. So another aspect of what parents can do is help ch children reframe um, what happens to them. Uh, one of the important things that we know from a lot of child development studies is the way that parents talk to children about what's happening to them in school, in activities, in their lives, can actually influence the kinds of memories that children form about what is happening to them. So for example, even in the um, experience of pain, the way that parents talk to children about the experience of going to the hospital, getting needles or getting treatments, can actually influence the pain memory that children actually um, recall having. And in some cases, when parents are very calm and very um, soothing and not overly um, anxious about what is happening to the child, they're, they're really almost a, a calming influence, a, a source of comfort, a source of stability. Um, if the child is upset, the parent is there to really calm them down and not the other way around. Um, Children learn, um, they, they start to model, they start to observe and begin to model the kinds of reactions that parents are having. And this can, in fact, lead them to develop very specific types of scripts for the way that they should um, react and respond to, in some cases, adverse situations. And then, of course, one of the things that we know from um, decades of, of research in um, behavior psychology, but also in other, in other um, theoretical approaches that look at really the social interactions between parents and children is how to reward good behavior um, in children to, very, to be very explicit in indicating to children that this, this was a really good way of handling this um, really bad situation and to talk through the reward so that it's not just a reward in, in the form of um, uh, a, a gift or, or, or something that is more external, but to, uh, to talk to the child about the reward of what it feels like to be learning how to self-regulate and to control their feelings and to be able to control certain aspects of the way that they respond to negative outcomes. And so, uh, anxiety and uh, something that is actually very natural in all of us, um, instead of um, allowing it to slowly build into something that is maladaptive, can actually be used to, to, to strengthen the way that a, a child and ultimately an adult is able to use the energy that comes from anxiety in very positive and, and useful ways. Because to be quite honest, I mean, there is, there is almost no... Um, um, accomplishment or ambitious individual who isn't in some way anxious uh, about the what they are doing, how they perform, because anxiety can have very good aspects of being able to focus attention and focus um, energy into being able to devote a lot of time to practicing or refining what we're doing and what we want to do. And so for children to be able to take that energy form and use it in a good way and to really help them accomplish what it is that they want to accomplish can be really a gift 
that um, children learn from their very loving parents and from, from their environments. Okay, so I am gonna end there and open it up to comments or questions. I'd be happy to hear from you. Oh, somebody asked me to speak a little bit louder. Did you not hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, good, good. Uh, thank you for a wonderful le lecture. Can you give us an example of um, when the child falls and cries? Um, obviously, we're thinking it's a little fake cry, there's no injury. How would you handle that situation? I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear the first part of your question. Could you repeat uh, that? I said, thank you for a wonderful lecture. I was wondering if you could give us some examples, um, how to, let's say if the child falls and cries and it's not uh, worrisome, there's no injury or anything, how would you handle that situation? Well, the way that I think most parents would when they realize that the, the child has not hurt um, himself or herself seriously. So for example, you obviously go to the child, you comfort the child, but you very quickly reassure the child that there is, that they're fine, that um, did you break anything? Oh, no, you didn't. Okay, you're fine. You can, you can get back on the, on the swing or you can get back on the jungle gym. Um, so to not uh, perseverate on an injury that actually isn't really an injury. Uh, I mean, children are going to fall and they're going to hurt themselves. That's what, that's what they do. They, they're going to be out in the world, experiencing the world. And that's, what, that's one of the things that the children will do. And so being able to comfort them, go to them, let them know that you're there, but also to reassure them that they're going to be fine, that they can get back on that uh, swing and they can get back on that horse and they're going to be okay to try again. That would be, that would be the way that I would suggest if the child is not seriously hurt. But you have to check that first. Yeah, thank you. Hi, do you have any suggestions as to um, how to help a child who is scared of being alone in the dark? Yeah, how old is the child? Like seven, eight years. Okay, so they're a little bit older. So first of all, it's very natural and normal for a child of seven or eight years to be afraid of the dark. And so one of the things is, um, do you know, have you talked to the child about why they're afraid of the dark? I spoke to the mom and she, she told me like um, she, the child has been very, very scared. Like uh, if, if she's alone in the dark. So she had been attending some parenting sessions and stuff, um, which was helping. But from my side, I, I, uh, I mean, the child did not open too much with me, but I just got the information from the mom. Okay, so um, the, one of the things that I would recommend is actually talking to the child about why they're scared. So getting to, get, finding out, actually beginning that conversation about why, talking to them about why they might be scared. They might be um, unable to sleep. They might, have, they might be thinking or, or ruminating about certain things that have gone on during the day and, and they feel very alone in the dark. Um, and once I, I, once you get a sense for why the child is, is, um, afraid, then the thing that can be done is either begin to talk to the child about how they might, um, quiet their mind during, uh, nighttime, uh, that might, that could involve reading a book right before bedtime so that they are, uh, tending to something else and not their thoughts while they're trying to fall asleep. So creating a structure for the child that sort of leads into bedtime, that leads into uh, them becoming sleepy and, and um, turning off the light and then falling asleep right after. So structure is actually a really important part of children um, learning to um, 
having their stress levels go down. So when children can anticipate structure and they begin to really like and gravitate toward the structure. So the structure could be at a certain time, we're gonna start getting ready for bed. You're gonna read a book. Then after you read the book and the parent can actually be there reading the book with the child. And then we're gonna turn off the light. Now at first, um, the, the structure might only go so far. What a child might also require is to have a, a small light um, put into their bedroom so that it's not completely dark, right? So they might have a little small light. You can actually get these little tiny bulbs that you sort of plug in and they provide a, a, a warm glow. Sometimes all the child needs is to know that that warm glow is there. And then right after they read the book or right after they do something, I wouldn't recommend any kind of devices or any kind of electronic devices right before bed, because that usually gets the child excited. And that usually begins to move to, to get the brain going. So you want to do something that is very calm and quiet and structured. Um, you almost creating an environment where everything is leading up towards bedtime. And then slowly, um, over time, the child begins to typically um, uh, calm down and anticipate sleep, anticipate the structure. Everything is always as it was the previous day. And that, stru that structure, believe it or not, can be very um, uh, calming for the child. And so I would begin with discussion so that the, the fear is actually, the child realizes that this is something of importance that people care about being able to voice. Because there might be something specific that the child is very scared of. If there is a noise, maybe that can be fixed. But if not, then, it's, then I suspect what it might be is that children's minds are very active, especially during the night. And so finding a way to quiet them down at nighttime can really help them. Just when they actually turn off the light, hit the sheets, actually fall to sleep. Sure, sounds good, thank you. Uh, but in this particular example, the mom was telling like she, the child would feel very anxious around the evening time after sunset basically, but after they had curtains in the house and light in the house, like they turn on their lights and stuff, she would feel better. So, I mean, she didn't have problems sleeping as such, but it was mainly at the sunset time, so. So the, so the mother did create structure for the child and the child still had some, some difficulties uh, sleeping, is if, if I'm understanding you correctly. Uh, no, what I'm trying to tell you is like, she did not have difficulty sleeping, but it was only temporary phase after the sunset when it used to turn dark. So if the uh, curtains were drawn on the windows and they turn on the lights in the house, she would feel better. But it was just that she was scared of dark. Like, for example, she wouldn't go to the basement by herself and those kind of things. Yes. And, and so that is actually quite normal and it's typical of children to be afraid of the dark and they don't want to go into the basement or any place that might be dark. So one of the things is that um, so that is actually quite typical for children. Um, they, they will go through a phase where they're afraid of the dark. Um, is if the, the child is, if it's getting in the way of actually sleeping, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still not sure if it is or isn't. It seems like it might be a, during part of the night. One of the things that parents can do is actually put in like little lights, um, like a small, um, not the, the, the full light in the bedroom, but just like a, a, a bedtime light. And the child knows that the bedtime light is on. And so it's not completely dark for the child. And so even if the child wakes up during the night, um, they're not completely in the dark. So um, if the child were older, I would be more concerned about the child being afraid of the dark. But the fact that the child is about seven to eight years, it's actually not uncommon for children to be afraid of the dark at that time. And so there are, there are some things that parents can do. Um, it seems like if the child is only waking up in the middle of the, or towards sun, sun, uh, the, the sun coming up, sundown, or, or uh, sunrise, I should say, uh, then it might not really be an issue. Uh, but having the, the bedtime light in the room might, might be helpful. Sure, sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Um, so there are lots of questions here. I, I'm going to see there is a very long question that I want to um, get to, but let me just very quickly read this. Uh, what to do with my eight-year-old who don't, doesn't admit his mistakes. Instead, what he does, something wrong or not in the way he's supposed to. All he says is, I am perfect. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. That, so that's, um, yeah. So one of the things is that um, he's eight years old. 
And, you know, depending on how that is affecting um, him in his uh, work, I don't know if it's a, um, um, if it's a boy or a girl, but uh, de depending on how that's affecting um, your child in school, it might actually just be something that he likes to say to sort of get a rise out of people in, in the room. So I wouldn't really be too concerned about that. But if it is actually interfering um, with the, the, the work that he is doing, I, I see now that um, um, if, with the work that your child is doing, then I would um, begin to, to, to find out why he's saying he's perfect and, and why he thinks perfection is such an important thing for, for him to be. Why does he want to be perfect? Where, um, where he's heard this. Um, he might be uh, watching a show or he might have somehow picked up that perfection is something that is sort of the ideal. I wouldn't be too worried about the perfection aspect of it. Like uh, kids say all kinds of things and they say it because in part they're trying to get a rise out of those around them. I mean, that's one of the things that children are learning is the reactions that adults have um, toward them when they say certain things and they're getting also, they're learning how to get attention. But if it's interfering with uh, the work that he is doing, for example, at school, he's not able to uh, to really use feedback, or he's um, being perhaps um, argumentative with teachers. Then it is debilitating, and it it might require, I would say, um, uh, a conversation about where he's picked up that perfection is is the ideal, and why um, why he's why he's doing this. Um, why does he think that um, he's perfect? And, and what are some things that he's afraid of in, in not being perfect? Um, you know, conversation with an eight-year-old is actually can be quite fruitful. Um, an eight-year-old is now at a stage where he's certainly going to be in a position to, to begin to think more abstractly, logically. He certainly has the capacity to read people around him, read people's faces, make inferences about what they're feeling. And he may be feeling actually that he has to be perfect to um, please people that are meaningful to him um, that are around him. And so I would certainly look into why he is saying this. It could be something that he's just saying to get a rise out of someone, but it could be something that could begin to interfere with the way that he uses the information of those significant adults around him. Okay, so let me just go to the next one here. I'm curious how to handle children who are very who have very different temperaments. Um, I have one child who is seven that is logical and likes to control situations. Most of the time, she is very energetic and has difficult time calming down, especially after a long day at school. She often needs many suggestions and reminders to bring the energy down and listen. And my other one, my son is three and is loving and emotional. Occasionally he has emotional outbursts. He will feed off my daughters with energy in different ways. It's tricky to handle both personalities at the same time. They need different tactics. Any suggestions how to handle the challenging times for kids at the same time? So you're quite right that children come into the world with very different temperaments. And I, I, um, your, your older uh, child seems to be very energetic and, and almost um, very much in control and wanting to be in control. And um, it's not surprising as a firstborn, it seems. Um, but the, the, the emotional and energetic outbursts of children it are, are things that... Uh, first of all, are, are typical of children. So they're going to have lots of energy. They are um, experimenting with a lot of different responses and emotions. And one of the things that they're going to be getting from you as a parent or a caregiver is how to, as you say, calm themselves down. So one of the things that you as a parent can model for children is how to um, sort of sit down and and sort of wind it down, maybe uh, actually uh, use up some of that energy by going for a walk or if they have a bike, going for a bike ride, or if there is something that they can do to burn off some of that energy to begin to sort of um, uh, point out to children that they have an excess amount of energy, that it's actually totally um, positive, but also that it can sometimes get in the way, especially if everybody's sort of sitting down to have dinner, for example. And so being able to model um, 
even verbally, actually actively, explicitly say, if you're feeling like you have a lot of energy, why don't we go figure out how to burn some of that off because it's actually leading you to um, have a burst of uh, maybe uh, say something to toward the other children that might be um, too aggressive or uh, perhaps even um, argumentative. I'm not saying that she's doing that, but in, in terms of all that energy, she might be channeling it in a way that could lead to that. Now for your um, other child um, who seems to be feeding off some of that energy, I think that's actually really uh, a positive thing. I mean, that's what siblings do for one another. Um, however, this is an opportunity where your younger child is also learning from their from their older sibling and also from you and the interaction that the family is having. Family dynamics are, are a very interesting and very influential aspect of child development and the way that you um, um, talk to your older child is something that the younger child is going to observe and learn from. So the very fact that you are modeling and talking to the older child about ways to um, bring down the energy, maybe burn some of that energy off, um, sort of even talk about where do you think all this energy is coming from? Did something happen at school that is leading you to have all this energy? Um, can actually be very helpful and for a younger child to begin to internalize ways to talk about emotions and self-regulation of emotions. So I, I do think that um, it, it seems that aside from just outbursts of energy, it can be a, a positive interaction and a positive exchange for your children and for you. How can I help my child who, who goes into an instant panic with sometimes a simple question? How old is your child? The, the person who, um, Marion, you, you asked, uh, how can I help my child when uh, my child goes into an instant panic when some, with sometimes a simple question? May I ask you, how old is your, your child? Depending on how old the child is, um, it, can, it can sometimes make a, make a difference. A child who's in school and is going into a panic uh, being asked a simple question is a very different situation than a very young child. Um, it could be that the child has learned at some point that not being able to respond to a question or depending on the type of question, they're going to suffer a consequence. And so if they've learned that some, somewhere, um, maybe with another adult or maybe with a sibling or maybe at school where they have learned to pair the inability to respond to a question with ridicule or with some kind of negative event, they might be very concerned about being asked questions that they don't know how to respond to. So understanding where that contingency or that, um, that fear um, has come from um, becomes very important. Um, Children, one of the things that is really interesting about the, the kinds of adverse things that happen to children that can actually lead to anxiety is that a, an event that is difficult and anxiety provoking for a child, if it can be talked through and if it can be um, uh, discussed and elaborated and frankly um, cast in an, in an uh, instructional and also compassionate kind um, perspective where the child feels protected and also feels like they were able to um, discuss any fears that they that they have in relation to the event the the very strong emotion of that event can actually be um, lessened so that it doesn't become something that begins to trigger much stronger emotions later on but if the event is not um, acknowledged or recognized, then it can continue to have a very powerful effect on the child. So if a child is going into a panic over simple questions, that would lead me to think that there it has something that has happened to the child that has led to that very strong emotional response because panic is a, is a serious word. Um, it's not just, oh, you know, not wanting to be asked a question, but it sounds like it might be something much more significant. Um, what response would a parent take during the pandemic? So that's a great response. That's a great question. I, I let me ask you what What do you mean during the pandemic in, in relation to the information that is being um, delivered through the media about uh, COVID and the pandemic, or is it about the health measures? Um, it depends on what exactly um, you might be referring to here, because there's a lot going on right now with the pandemic. So it's a great question, but there's actually a lot going on. Um, 
Okay. Uh, is there, I'm wondering if you can, yes, with anxiety, is there something about the pandemic that you can sort of point to? Because I think that many, many people, many young children are probably feeling a lot of um, fear right now um, related to the pandemic. Um, not surprising. Uh, I think that's it's very typical response from children because there is a lot of fear out there in, in the media right now. And there's a lot of fear that people are experiencing. Also, very young children tend to be afraid of masks. Um, they tend to be afraid of when people are wearing face coverings, you know, like if almost like they're, they're, they're not able to read faces. And this can actually, people, children get a lot of information from facial expressions. They, there's actually a part of the brain that is processing facial, um, facial composition and facial expression. And so not being able to read faces is really difficult uh, for children and frankly for adults. And so you, you have almost like this constellation of of variables that can lead children to to be very afraid and very fearful. So you not only have the really uh, strongly negative news um, in the media that is constant, but then you have um, the, the the masks and people who, in some cases, I've heard. I don't know if this is the case for everyone, but people have um, commented to me that they feel like people are less friendly when they go outside and they're walking around. And then also, on you layer on top of that, people who are wearing masks and the um, the, the pandemonium that is that is going on in some schools. And children naturally are going to become very um, concerned and afraid. This is where uh, the parental response becomes so vital. Uh, talking to children about what is happening, that it is going to pass, that um, masks are being worn because people are trying to keep each other safe, that it is going to be something that is soon is going to end once we get um, the 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 health of the of the population or the health of people um, more in check that um, these are just measures that shouldn't be considered as scary measures, but they're, they're things that doctors think are good things for people to do in order to protect themselves. Casting it in a, in a more positive light and also for the child to watch you, very importantly, as the parent, because at the end of the day, children are going to be a lot less concerned with what is happening around them than with what is happening to the parent and the family. And so if the parent and the family can show the child that it's going to be okay, we're going to get through this, I know it's tough, but we're doing this because we're trying to keep everybody safe. So even though it might look a little scary, it's actually something that is going to help us in the long run, can really help children reframe a negative situation into something that can be, is, is more positive. Um, my, my five-year-old is very hard on himself. He cries if he can't get his jacket up all by himself. How do I help him lighten up and problem solve? <laughs> yeah, that's great. So, um, you know, I would have a moment with um, your, your five-year-old where when he's being really hard on himself and he's uh, crying because he can't, he can't get his jacket up all by himself, I'd say, hey, you know, look how well you're doing. Like just even the little things you've done to get your jacket on, you have done so well, like, like almost overwhelm the child with the positive um, accomplishment that he's had just by putting on that one sleeve, right? You're going to get there. How about tomorrow we work on the second sleeve? So you got your sleeve up. That was great. That's all you really needed to do today. But okay, let me just stop this. Um, that's all you needed to do today. Um, tomorrow we're going to work on the second sleeve. I don't want you to do any more than one sleeve today. Tomorrow we're going to work on the second sleeve. Slowly bring him up into doing the full jacket, right? So he feels like right now he might think, well, everybody I see around me is putting on their coat and doing it so well. Why can't I? You know, this happens to, with children as well when they draw. Uh, when children begin to draw, they, they have sort of, they, they know what they see and then they reproduce it on paper and they know the difference. 
right? They know that something that they wanted to draw isn't actually coming out as they as they are seeing it and as they hoped they could draw it. Children can say, oh, this is no good. Or and and in fact, what they what children sometimes have difficulty is to understand their own limitations. And one of the things that parents can do is celebrate what they can do and to really emphasize that that's actually all they're expected to do. All you're expected to do right now is to put on that one sleeve and then you're going to get the second sleeve tomorrow or the next day. And then ultimately they build up to putting on their full coat. Okay, let me see here. Um, I have a question about around specific anxiety. My 10 year old son is terrified of needles. We've tried going through practice scenarios, breathing techniques. We've tried to calm calm him down, but once the needle gets close, it's almost a fight or flight situation. Any suggestions? Yes. So it is, to, it is very common for kids to be afraid of needles. Um, needles are scary, um, even for adults. Um, so one of the things um, that, so everything you've tried um, is really good, actually. So the fact that you've tried um, to do practice scenarios, breathing techniques, all good. Um, but one of the things that I would try to do is not to have your, your son look at the needle. Um, so one of the things is, is that, um, I'm, I'm assuming this is kind of like a flu shot or something like that, which is the, the, the prick is actually quite, um, small. One of the things that can be done is that to talk. So first of all, one, one first thing to do is, um, talk to the child about a reward. If they can be really brave and uh, not look at the needle. They're not even gonna notice when it happens. And if they can sort of just sit still and get the needle, they're going to get a reward. Um, it could be like, um, I, maybe there's a favorite activity that they like to do, maybe more time on, on an iPad or maybe spending time with mom or dad in, in a certain capacity that they really enjoy or, or whatever it might be that, that you know the child really likes. And, one of the things that I would do is I would use that as just a way to entice the child to not look at the needle. And when the needle comes, and um, so even though I know you've done the practice scenarios, sometimes the needle is too overwhelming visually and perceptually for children. So you, it, it, it helps to not look at the needle when they're getting a shot. And so um, as they're sitting there about to get the shot, make sure they don't look at it and then um, sort of talk to the child. And as you are, um, capture their attention, talk to the child, the, the doctor or the nurse, whomever is coming close with the needle and you're talking to them and you're saying to the child, you're not going to feel this. This is going to be like a, a single prick and you're not going to feel it. And just think about how good it's going to be when we go out and do this and essentially divert their attention away from the needle and onto whatever activity you are planning to do with them. And then once they feel it, um, even if they go, ah, I felt it. And say, oh, that was nothing. That was nothing. And again, bring back their attention to the activity. One of the things that can really highlight pain for children is the attention to the pain. And one of the tricks to um, help children uh, not build up pain or build up the anticipation of pain is to try to get them to think about things aside from whatever it is that might lead them to the pain. Okay. Um, I don't know if that'll work, but you can try it, right? So it all depends sometimes on children and what maybe you've tried in the past. Um, uh, the face mask really does something for kids. The face mask really does something to kids. Um, I'm not sure um, if that's a question or more like a, um, a comment, like in a good or positive way. Um, a comment. Yeah. Yeah. The face mask for kids is, it's actually interesting. I watch children and some kids are really okay with wearing the face mask and some kids, oh, they're not so good with it. And so you really do need to sort of bring kids slowly up to wearing the mask, almost like making it like, well, well, today we're going to play 
like we're doctors and doctors wear masks. And one of the things we're gonna do is walk around with a mask because we're doing our bit for society and sort of almost make them feel like superheroes uh, wearing masks. And so part of it um, to help kids adapt to certain changing circumstances is to make them feel like they're part of something and that they're contributing, especially because they see you excited. When children see parents excited, they get excited. They think, oh, this is something big. This is something that I need to be a part of. Um, but when they see uh, parents sort of, um, frankly, nervous and anxious, um, they're also going to say, oh, this is no good. This is actually not, not good for me. So um, as, as, as parents, we, we have to really watch what we do because children are taking our cue, taking cues from, from, from individuals, from adults. Any other uh, questions? How to help adolescents when they look upset but don't want to share what's wrong and just say it's all fine. Yeah, um, adolescents, so adolescents are not gonna talk to parents about things that are actually not um, huge problems and they would rather um, talk to their friends about it. Um, it Adolescents will tend to talk to parents about things that are just much more serious, such as um, things that have to do with values or life decisions. But if it's something to do with friends or something to do with, with um, their social relationships at school, often um, adolescents won't talk to parents because they, they're beginning to see peers as being much more in tune with what they um, understand and how they understand the environment. So if you have a close relationship with your child and your child just isn't talking to you about something because they, they, they may not, it's not that they don't want to burden you, it's that they may not think that you can fully understand what it is that they're going through. And if, it, if, it's, if they're not telling you and, and you see that it does pass, then it's most likely the case that it's something that is quite transient and, and not something to, to worry about. However, if it is something that um, persists, then I would, um, I, would, I would also persist in trying to talk to the child and to say, you know, maybe, maybe you don't think I'll understand, but maybe I can listen. And you can just sort of tell me, and I promise I won't say anything uh, because maybe I don't fully understand everything, but I'll, I'm here to listen. I want to listen. I want to, I want to know, I want to learn about what is happening to you, even if maybe I can't help, but I'm here to listen. So maybe that's one way to begin the conversation. Just, just to promise that you, that you can listen, that you, that you want to listen. And especially if it persists, it might not. So then maybe um, they're able to talk to a friend. Okay. Um, can you explain the difference between the covert parenting of invalidating feeling, just saying, oh, you're okay, that was fine. So covert parenting, uh, co sorry, covert parenting of invalidating feeling is when um, parents uh, essentially suggest that the child isn't actually feeling the way that they are and they don't recognize or they don't acknowledge the feeling. Um, and so the, the, in fact, the parent might even become upset because the child is upset. Uh, no, you shouldn't be upset. I'm not, you shouldn't be upset. That, why is that upsetting you? Um, just get over it. That, that can be, um, that can be difficult for children because they want to have who they are acknowledged. They want to be able to have their feelings recognized. And so um, there is, you're, you're quite right, this is a, a really interesting question because there is a difference between invalidating feelings and recognizing a child's feelings and saying, yeah, I know you're upset, let's talk about why you're upset, but let's talk about why, or let's talk about how um, you might want to move on from feeling upset because at some point you may want to get back and try for that team again or you may want to try and be friends with this person again. So it's, it's important to recognize feelings and to validate children's feelings, but also then help them understand that at some point they may want to move on from those feelings and that there is a path forward for moving on from those feelings. So there's a difference there. The, 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 um, the, the first, uh, when you don't validate feelings and you just sort of brush it off, 
children can feel like they don't matter and their feelings are invisible. And that can really hurt children. That can actually lead to children not talking to parents um, because they don't think that they'll understand. But if feelings are acknowledged and then a parent problem solves with a child to try and, and help the child move past those feelings, that is an, an opportunity for um, um, children to learn how to reframe, as I was saying, um, what, what has happened to them. And we all need it. I mean, it's not just children. Adults need that too. Uh, that's why we people talk to trusted friends and, and um, in terms of how to reframe uh, experiences that have happened to them. And, and sometimes you need another perspective, especially a trusted perspective to help you see something that you haven't been able to see. Okay, maybe I'll take one more um, and then uh, we'll end the, the, um, the session. I know that you're all, uh, it, it's, it's late. I think it's like past eight o'clock or something. It's a 10, okay. Um, so there's a really long question here, but let's, let's tackle that one. My five and a half year old son is out of control. He doesn't follow rules, whether at school or home, he just does what he wants. Although I keep talking to him all the time and remind him about what's right and what's wrong and the consequences of his behaviors. Most times we agree on stuff. For example, we go out like grandmas, don't touch other stuff, don't take things that aren't yours. He would say, yes, mom, I'll behave good and be a good boy, but soon he forgets, or I don't know, maybe he ignores me. He is very smart though. Some at school teachers complain that he makes a lot of noise and he's out of control. Okay, so what I would say is that um, children, um, certainly at five years, um, have learned um, that they can get away with stuff. Um, and that's one of the things that I would recommend is for you to create um, some real structure. And I don't know if you have or not, but to really create a predictable environment for the child. And that might mean uh, timeouts if the child is not able to follow rules and to actually follow through with the timeouts. And one of the things that is going to be really important for the five-year-old is to see you be very, very consistent in the way that you respond to the child. If you are not consistent, the child will not be consistent either. The child will essentially model the inconsistency that they see in the home. And so if you say A and then B, and if you don't do B after A, the child will learn that they can get away with not doing B after A either as well. So one of the things that I would um, sit down and really begin to think about is the, the uh, structure, the, the rules and the consequences for breaking rules and what is happening in the house in that regard. Also, when talking about what you expect from the child, make sure that um, you don't overwhelm the child with lots of information. Just be very clear, very direct, use simple, clear sentences in terms of, we're going to grandmother's house and I don't want you to, we go out to grandma like, and we, I don't want you to touch anything in the house. If you touch anything in the house, we leave. And now, I don't know if, if I've gotten the, the scenario correct there, but the point is, is that um, if you do then go out to grandmother's house and if um, your, your child uh, breaks the rule that you, that you expected him to follow, then follow through on what you've said, you leave grandma's, grandma's house. What you want to help your child learn is the contingency between what you say and the consequences that come after that. And children need very consistent rule following on behalf of the parents so that the child learns that this is an aspect of their behavior that they need to follow through on. And so if at any point you break your own rules or you break your own um, messaging to the child, the child will get confused and they will get um, rowdy in terms of, because they think actually they can do almost anything because, well, I know mom and dad tend to break their own rules, so I can do that too. So it becomes really important to really follow through. Um, if if the, the, your child is expecting um, rules to potentially be broken or maybe kind of bent a little bit at home, they will expect the same thing at school. And so it becomes actually also um, difficult because now you're, you're, you're trying to 
help your child with self-regulation, not only at home, but also at school. So one of the first things I would do is try and create a very structured environment for the child, be very clear and straightforward with the rules. Um, do timeouts when, the, when, the, when your five-year-old doesn't follow the, the rules. And the other thing too, is that um, if there are too many activities in the child's um, day, that can actually really tire kids and they, can, they, they might appear to be out of control, but they're really tired and they're sort of just acting out. And sometimes you need to actually have a lot more downtime for a child to sort of um, rest and, and be able to collect um, the, the activities, the thoughts, the, the feelings that he's had during the day. And so um, make sure that, that he's not being overscheduled or there are too many activities that he's doing and that there is a very clear and predictable structure to his day. And then he will learn to love that structure. In fact, um, children will often tell um, babysitters if they have really clear structure, I always do this at seven. I always do this at, you know, 7.30 because that's what mom and dad expect me to do at seven. You know, so children love to be able to predict their environment. Do everything you can to try and help your child predict what is going to happen to him during the day consistently. Thank you for that question. All right. Great, thank you so much um, for this presentation and for taking the time to answer our questions with such depth and knowledge, we really appreciate it. And this session will be available on our website uh, later on. So just keep an eye out for that. And yeah, have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, bye.